Welcome back. Um, as we continue to build the blocks and unpacking this animal called democracy, one of the most problematic areas of democracy is the management of elections, as we have had. And the panel before us is going to zoom into that area and perhaps help us exercise uh, the concept of elections and its contribution either to the advancement or to the, to the degradation of our democratic systems. And the, the person who is going to lead uh, that panel is none other than Dr. Marianne Kamera, who is uh, the director of uh, the Mandela School of Governance Building Bridges uh, Program. Uh, the Building Bridges Program, uh, of which I am an, um, an alumni, uh, is, uh, is a leadership development platform that brings together key African stakeholders from both researchers and practitioners in an intergenerational dialogue with the aim of deepening understanding around challenges confronting the continent. In 2014, uh, Marianne initiated the flagship Emerging African Leaders Program, which now is over 100 alumni from 10 African countries. She works with a team of facilitators to develop innovative leadership and accountability programs. Uh, prior to joining uh, the university and the school, Marianne co-founded the international anti-corruption NGO Global Integrity uh, and headed the anti-corruption research at the Institute for Security Studies. Marianne is passionate about leadership development and she's, uh, a qualify she's qualified as an integral coach through UCT's Center for Coaching at the, graduate, uh, at the Graduate School of Business. She currently serves on the advisory board of the Center for Advancement of Public Integrity at Columbia Law School. Marianne holds uh, master's degrees in public policy and political philosophy from Oxford and the University of Stellenbosch. Her PhD in political studies from the University of Wits uh, focuses on corruption and reform in democratic South Africa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Marianne and a very able uh, panel before us to tackle the problem of elections and democracy. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Um, well, I, I'm incredibly grateful to the Coffee Annan Foundation. I'm thinking of Sebastian and his co-conspirator Mabel Satoli from the Nelson Mandela School, who without them collaborating, we wouldn't be here. And it really is an extraordinary opportunity. I also want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I think for the UCT community, it's a very difficult time. I think for South Africans, it's a very difficult and shameful time. And I think this is a really important conversation that this platform has provided. So I'm very personally grateful for this opportunity. Having been here from early this morning, it was very inspiring, as always, hearing Mama Grassa Michelle. Um, her frankness, her authenticity, her integrity, her leadership. Um, and I wouldn't have missed that for the world. And I think the panels that we've had subsequently have really helped frame us until we get to this part of the afternoon, which I know it's been a long day, um, but I can promise you that you're in for a treat so if we think of how we've moved from quite a, a broad panel on democracy and framing that to looking at so democracy and globally and then looking at governance and regionally, we're now moving towards a panel which is on e elections and institutions. And I think the interplay between elections themselves, as someone said earlier this morning, elections do not a democracy make, but they are essential. Um, there are other aspects which make um, democracy possible, and these are some of the key institutions. And the panel which we have today will talk to some of those key institutions, such as the media, such as the judiciary, and such as political parties themselves. And so when we look at what this panel was setting out to do, it was to 
let's just revisit that to interrogate whether elections promote and protect democracy, to identify key institutions that hold the line of integrity and legitimacy in electoral processes, to discuss some key electoral outcomes and trends, and we've started hinting at that earlier this afternoon, and then to interrogate whether there is an effect, a level playing field between opposition parties, ruling parties, and what are the sort of indicators which can support multi-party democracy. So you do have the bios of our panel in the program, but I'd just like to briefly introduce the order of our panelists. And it's such a pleasure to um, interact with colleagues from the University of Cape Town. You might know, those of you who work in universities, that they're often quite siloed, so an opportunity to meet with colleagues um, from the university is, is a wonderful platform. And so we'll have four interventions. Each speaker will have a chance to speak for eight to ten minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. And so our first speaker is Dr. Sushua Sushua, who is a Zambian intellectual and a historian who will give us an overview of a very concrete example of the Zambian ex experience of elections um, during a particular time period, but also reflect on the interaction between elections and democracy. He's also associated with the University of Cape Town's Institute for Democracy, <laughs> Citizenship and Public Policy, We'll then have an input from Mr. Matthias Kronker, who I know has flown in. I know a lo number of you have flown in, so also appreciate you, you being here for the panel. And he'll be talking specifically around political parties and some of the challenges around um, the electoral dimensions of political parties themselves and some of the obstacles which they, they have. He also has some experience with the Afrobarometer, so can frame some of our conversation with some insights from the region. We then have Miss Alison Tilly, um, who's a longtime friend and colleague and who is working on Judges Matter and has, was formerly the executive director of the Open Democracy Advice Center and has a very deep understanding of access to information as well as a commitment to rule of law and looking particularly at the role of an independent judiciary in upholding democratic governance. And our last panelist will be Mr. Hopewell Chinona, who is a well-known regional journalist and political commentator and will be able to comment specifically on the media and possibly social media, but also thinking about the media's role in terms of the interplay between elections and democracy. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you. Um, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, coming from Zambia, where it's very hot, uh, the Cape Town weather I have learned is fairly undemocratic. <laughs> <coughs> I'm very certain that if we had to vote, very few of us would vote for it. Uh, I think the Zambian one would, would be made triumphant. Uh, so if I sound uh, low, it's because the weather is bad. <laughs> I think that... Um, we have had since morning um, uh, the interaction between various institutions and democracy, but at the center of all that uh, is elections. Uh, they f elections feed basically into other institutions, whether it's uh, um, the judiciary, whether it's the, the media, whether it's political parties. Uh, they act as the driver uh, or the motor of democratization. S uh, since the, 90, e the early 1990s, uh, Southern Africa has undergone um, uh, the post-third wave uh, practicalities, which saw the reintroduction of multipartism in um, um, a number of countries. Zambia, where I come from, being one of the uh, the pioneers in that regard. Malawi, um, Zimbabwe, um, um, uh, Dr. Kong, DRC, Congo, um, and Namibia as well as South Africa after the end of apartheid followed uh, suit. Since then, we have had um, a number of competitive 
and um, mixed multi-party elections in these countries. Um, and I think that a platform like this one uh, provides us with an opportunity to reflect or take stock on how far we have come and to determine the road ahead. So what I want to share with you is basically two things. Uh, the first is to f uh, uh, speak more broadly on the question of the interplay or interaction between elections and democratization or democratic consolidation. And secondly, to speak a bit about the, the challenges that perhaps we could talk about that should inform how we proceed from here. Um, so elections are um, the drivers of democratization in uh, a number of ways. First, they um, encourage opposition groups, that is political parties, um, civil society, and even international actors or donors um, to push for institutional reforms. Um, for example, when an election is, is rigged, or at least widely regarded as having been rigged, um, we saw uh, what happened in Malawi early this year, uh, the protest that followed the aftermath of the election uh, suggest that the citizens were not convinced that uh, that was a fair and accurate representation of the will of the people. Um, we saw what happened in the DRC. Um, to, call it, to call what took place as an, elec as an election is uh, to be very generous. Uh, it was much more of an organized trans internal transfer of power. And, if, um, and we saw what happened in Zambia in 2016. Um, the opposition rejected the, the results. Uh, and in so doing, um, I think that they, um, they helped entrench the view that elections uh, are regarded as acceptable if the losers, for example, recognize the results as, uh, as an accurate reflection of what it took place. Um, we are heading to an election in Botswana this year. We haven't had much problems there. Um, we had elections in South Africa uh, this year. We saw that the turnout was uh, uh, very uh, uh, unimpressive, so to say, in compared to the previous elections. Um, almost nine million, I think, voters, eligible voters, stayed away. Um, that is, should concern us. Um, so when you have elections like what, what happened in Zimbabwe, I would go back slightly to 2008 because that's a key election. It was so bad um, that uh, to even call it an election, I think, is to be, uh, it's, a mat it's a matter of discretion. <laughs> um, but what elections do is to encourage institutional reforms in the aftermath of a disputed or a rigged election. Um, civil society, uh, donors, opposition parties could push for a more independent electoral commission in the aftermath of such events. Um, and, and in so doing, uh, they help to build confidence in the electoral system in a way that makes turnover likely that is a transfer of power or alternation of power at the next election. Um, we will not be in a position to actually push for those institutional reforms in, in the absence of uh, um, a bad election. I'm, I'm not trying to say we should have more bad elections, but I'm <coughs> saying that they can actually be helpful 
to push for those reforms. Because what you have in Zimbabwe, for example, the constitution that you have in Zimbabwe, which is widely regarded as very, a very, very good document, we must remember was a product essentially of the 2008 election. It started from there, and we said, how could we prevent this from happening in the future? The 2013 and 2018 elections um, were far from being impressive, but they were certainly better than the 2008 elections. We must take these little or small achievements on board to say uh, we have now something that we didn't have before, and that was facilitated by elections. The second way in which elections speak more widely to democratization is in relation to the promotion of civil, civil liberties. Um, it's fairly difficult for opposition parties, for example, to mobilize um, and to organize in between elections. Um, but during the period leading up to elections, for example, what we see is the opening up of the political space. They are able to assemble, they are able to associate, the media is able to uh, uh, report and uh, that's present different candidates and parties and enable citizens basically to speak to each other but also to learn of the policy appeals of these competing political entrepreneurs. And um, to the extent that the civic rights are respected during that uh, period of elections, um, you would say that um, uh, over time, repeated competitive multi-party elections help in entrenching the culture of respecting civic liberties and even the rule of law. Um, Zambia, for example, was uh, a, consolidated a consolidating democracy until about 2011. Uh, the country held elections in 1991, the so-called founding elections, and then you had 96, 2001, 2006, um, 2011, um, and 2016. And until 2011, um, there was general agreement that there was widespread respect for civic, li for civic liberties. Um, and, and it was because of that that um, uh, we see two turnovers, for example, even within that period, 1991 and, and 2011, peaceful transfers of power. Um, I'm not very sure if there is a country in the region that claims that, that distinction. Um, Maybe I'm biased because I'm from Zambia. So you should forgive me if there is a country that has that record. But the wider point is that um, there is um, a huge link between uh, the promotion of civic liberties and elections. Uh, but also elections, if um, they are seen as fair uh, and legitimate, provide a peaceful means of changing uh, leadership. And, 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 and to, in the absence of elections, what you have is uh, uh, the removal of power, the removal of leaders through uh, bullets uh, or military uh, uh, um, transfers of power. Elections provide an assured way of ensuring that we, uh, we have a peaceful removal of power. Let me just finish by speaking a little bit about the, the challenges uh, that have arisen since the 1990s. I'll speak very briefly to about three or four of those. The first is, is, is with regard to access um, to the campaign um, uh, places. In places like Zimbabwe, for example, the opposition are confined to campaigning to particular spaces because certain parts of the country are militarized. And it's very difficult for opposition then to, to reach out to these um, to these areas in a way that then affects the outcome of the elections because the, the, the space is not, the, the platforms and the, and the campaigns uh, is not, are not free and accessible. In Zambia also, violence prevents opposition from reaching certain parts of, uh, 
uh, of the country, and this is something that you see across the region. Um, the second challenge is that of electoral management. I think we have, we have talked about this, and so I won't belabor this point, but, but the protests that you have seen in Malawi, in DRC, for example, really speak to this challenge of electoral management, a lack of independent electoral bodies. How do we resolve that going forward? Because unless we attend to this, what happened in Congo this year is likely to happen at the next election. And if, uh, we need to agree on what can be done. Then you have the question of uh, the international actors uh, versus local actors in terms of election observers. Uh, many election observers, especially from within the region, endorse the elections even before the results are announced. So you have a situation where uh, even the flawed election in Malawi or in Kenya or in Zambia, the, uh, I served in one of these bodies at the local level. They said, they will even go to the political elites and say, what do you want us to say? <laughs> and then they will go and say that uh, before the election. Now. So when, when the, the European election observer, for example, says, well, the elections were, were you know, free but not fair, uh, ZANU-PF would say, well, that is expected because this is the, it's the EU, or it's the British, they are imperialists. So it, so it sets a collision between local and international observers. Uh, and, and, and then what the leadership do is is to use these institutions or bodies to legitimize what are essentially f very fraudulent elections. How do we resolve that? And then the final point is the question of um, um, the opposition parties themselves, for example, because they're crucial uh, uh, players, and, and Math Mathias will speak more broadly to political parties. But many of these uh, political institutions, organizations, you know, are not institutionalized. They have scarce resources. Um, they uh, face continued obstruction, of course, from the ruling elites. Um, but um, it's very difficult to have a democratic and free election if you are uh, a, a, an opposition party, for example, that is competing against the ruling party. That is not uh, that is fairly weak. Um, and how do we strengthen parties going forward? Because the quality of the elections will to a large extent be determined by the quality of the political actors themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Ishu. I think there are a range of rich issues, and we can pick them up um, in the conversation. But thanks for framing that very well. Thanks. Uh, and yeah, thanks, Ishu, for, for setting this up really nicely. So I want to, in, in the opening remarks, just briefly um, outline why we should care about parties um, and the different roles that, that they should be playing. And to the extent to which they are playing them. And if there's time, I'll look at some of the problems. Otherwise, we can look at them in the, in the discussion uh, later on. And I'm hoping to draw on, in the spirit of, of the conference, really on, on the diversity of, of parties across different countries, but even within countries. Um, and sometimes I'll venture outside the, uh, the region to, to Tanzania and Ghana. Um, and so yeah, as, as Sishua said, the first and I guess most important part of, of what parties are meant to do is uh, being an option on election day. If nothing else, citizens should have a chance to vote. Not just yes or no to a particular party, but at least have one alternative. And the problem often starts here already. Some parties uh, in, in countries, for example in Malawi, um, they don't even run candidates in every single constituency. So, how can we ask citizens to participate in democracy if parties, and sometimes it's not even because of the government, it's purely because the party, and um, this is a point I'll, I'll make throughout here, they don't do enough of the work. Sometimes they can't find someone that would represent the party on their behalf in an election. I mean, let's think about this for a moment. You, a party can't find someone to stand in an election. And so how can we at that point then ask citizens to go to the polls? Who are they meant to vote for? Um, so this is one thing, is just to present an electoral option. Another issue is mobilization. Um, we recently had the South African elections, and Sishua was pointing out how many people, I think you said 9 million voters, who didn't go to the polls. This is two decades after the end of apartheid. People don't think it's worth spending their time going to the votes. If we compare this with, for example, Tanzania, where 
just the mere amount of contact that parties have with citizens outstrips that of any other country in, on the continent. And this is not just the CCM, it's Shadema as well. They're able to reach the people. And I think if, if we compare this to the South African example, Tanzania is much less democratic than South Africa. So we can't blame it on the regime here. We have to really think about what is the ANC doing, or what is it not doing, and what's the DEA not doing, as well as the EFF. Do they not care enough? Do they think they can get away with it? Um, so I think these are other important questions. Is the Parties are meant to mobilize, and if they don't, we should think about why is that the case. Do they not care? Do they think they, they can do more with less? Um, and I think linked to that is once a party is in all countries of the in all corners of a country, they're also able to to exercise um, electoral accountability. So, if we take uh, the Ghanaian elections, for example, they're always very tight. Um, but the people, or the, the the actors who are most interested in counting the votes accurately, are the parties, even more so than electoral uh, oversight bodies, and so. If you have um, party representatives in each, con in each constituency able to be there and count the votes, this might be much more effective than any reformed electoral monitoring body because they have the real incentives to count for that. And so we see the difference between uh, the recent Zimbabwean elections and, and maybe the Ghanaian elections where the MBC was not able to put people in every single constituency to oversee the results. In Ghana, that was the case. So again, this important role of if we want free and fair elections, I think parties should also learn, especially opposition parties, should learn from, from other parties, not in the north. There's no point for the MBC to go to Germany and learn from the Social Democrats, how do you run an election? It's devoid of context. They should go to Ghana and ask, how did you do it? You've got incredibly tight elections somehow, it's not without its, its flaws, but somehow you manage to agree on a political power turnover. That is huge. But we don't have enough of those conversations between opposition parties um, across the continent to learn from, from those experiences. Um, so I think a second point is, in addition to, to just providing a, an option on, on election day, is holding the executive accountable uh, as well as the ruling party. Um, and one obstacle to that is, um, in, again, in countries like Malawi, for example, the huge number of independents that are running. So if you have more than 20, 25% of your parliament that are independents, they're meant to do everything. They're meant to do oversight, they're meant to legislate, they're meant to talk to the constituencies, uh, and they're meant to come up with policies. That's impossible for any single person. You need a part, you need a functioning party to do that. Um, and so we can ask, um, how could either independence organize better or what causes the emergence of independence? And I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Um, alternatively, we have countries like South Africa and, and Namibia where um, the executive is so huge, we've got so many ministries, and in, in those cases, ministers are drawn from parliament. So what happens? The legislature is meant to oversee the executive, but if we have 30 ministers in the South African parliament, those 30, they won't hold government accountable. Why should they? In the case of Namibia, it's even more extreme. We've got also a huge number of, of, of uh, ministers, and we've got a much smaller cabinet. So if 25% or 30% of your parliament is also as a ministerial post, who is going to hold who accountable? And so as we, as we advocate for, for changes, we need to really look at how many ministries are necessary. I'm not saying there's a perfect number, um, but we seriously need to think about the proportions and what it does to accountability. We're, we're effectively manipulating democracy if we, if we take out that extent of, of accountability. A third, a third really important role, I think, is that of um, representing communities. So MPs are meant to, to represent what their constituencies want. Now, by show of hands, how many of you, and luckily we come from very different countries, how many of you know their member of parliament? 
Okay, on the panel, this is two out of five. This is, I mean, if we have a problem, if you want to complain, <laughs> we don't know where to go. Um, and if we look at, at um, public opinion data, um, so for full disclosure, I'm working with one of the public opinion um, institutes, Afrobarometer, and we ask, do you know or can you identify your MP? In South Africa, 4% of people could identify their MP. 4%. These MPs, they get millions of rand a year, and we don't even care to find out their names. If we look at other countries like Zimbabwe, the number is much higher. So it's not an issue of do you live in a rich country, do you live in a poor country. MPs in Zim have a much more incentive to, to be there. Same in Zambia, same in, in Malawi. They want you to know their name. In South Africa, they, they don't care because the, the constituents themselves, they don't need them. They need to be put on the list by the party elites. And so they cater to whatever they need. And, and that is another thing when we think about changing some of these things. The electoral system, it might just be a bunch of rules, but it really changes the incentives on what MPs do or don't do. If, if MPs don't come to a constituency, um, they have no way of finding out they can go on Twitter, but really, like, that's not how you find out about what, what your people really want. Um, so this is, this is, I think, a really, really important um, difference. And, and lastly, MPs also ought to explain what they do in Parliament to the constituents. What is it? What, what laws are they advocating for? What is your MP doing? Do, do the values align, or at the very least, do they tell you, did they vote for or against state capture? Or did they vote for or against uh, abortion laws? These are things, if we're active citizens, um, we ought to, to want to find out. I'd argue, even if we're just ordinary citizens, not necessarily interested in politics, we ought to want to know about that. Um, and then lastly, um, so I've, I've got a thing for election um, posters. And I think in the most recent election, the DA um, wanted to put out a policy or, or wanted to look programmatic and clever. So they had one of the posters a, that came out just after the, the rolling blackouts, the electricity blackouts. And on, on it, it said, uh, blackouts, keep the lights on. Is that your idea of programmatic policy, to tell me to keep the lights on if there's a blackout? I mean, even if I'm dissatisfied with the ANC, at the very least, I know they were not that stupid to put that on a poster and distribute it. Why would I want to vote for the, a for the DA in, in that situation? So it's also about not only are parties meant to go out and tell people what, they, or actually talk to them, but they should also think about what they tell them, talk to them about. Um, and again, I w there are definitely constraints and there, there, there are issues around electoral violence in certain countries, but I would argue even in the more democratic countries in the sub-region, parties need to do more, and they need to do it better. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Matthias. I think you've raised also the very interesting point about accountability whether it's to the party, whether it's between citizens and their local MPs. Um, I think there are reasons in the South African experience, but we'll go into that during the discussion. Alison? So I, I think you can probably tell my view on judges, given the name of, of the campaign I'm working on, which is called Judges Matter. So um, it, it will not come as a, as a surprise that... Um, I would take the view that a strong judiciary is necessary in, in an electoral system uh, in order to make sure that disputes can be credibly resolved uh, in the courts. The, the difficulty I think that, that we have um, in, across the continent is that there are a number of issues which are plaguing the judiciary and I think many of those issues are, are common. 
um, a, a, across different jurisdictions. If you want to look at the sort of standards that, that judiciaries should be uh, meeting, um, we do have a series of international uh, instruments and agreements, one of them being the Bangalore Principles on Judicial Conduct. And they really try to speak to the importance of competent courts, independent courts, and impartial courts. Um, the implementation of all rights, including the right to vote, ultimately depend on the administration of justice. And having that kind of, of judiciary, which can uphold constitutionalism and the rule of law, um, is really of utmost importance in a, in a modern and democratic society. The Bangalore principles themselves put the primary responsibility for promoting and maintaining high standards of judicial conduct on the judiciary itself. Um, they presuppose that judges are accountable for their conduct to appropriate institutions, which are established to maintain judicial standards. So judges are both independent and accountable. It's, a, it's an interesting balance uh, and, and sometimes a challenging one. Uh, we have more homegrown principles in terms of, of uh, judges, for example, the Lelongwe principles and guidelines on the selection and appointment of judicial officers, which was adopted in Lilongwe in 2018, looking at the process for the, the, the appointment of judges. If we look at how we're measuring up to these kinds of principles, I think we would have to concede that there are many challenges across the continent. Um, we recently held a, a conference of the um, Judicial Officers Association in South Africa uh, with the um, African regional chapter of the International Association of Judges. Um, so that was judicial officers from 23 countries looking at the questions of judicial independence and accountability. And I think it's, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm never, uh, it, 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 it remains surprising to me. I, I don't know that it should. But the, the, the kinds of issues that they were talking about are just really startling. So one of the questions that, that came up, and, and particularly in the context of, of our colleagues from, from Mali, um, was the question of security in the courts. And the question was very blunt. The question was, should we, as judges, carry guns? So it's not, you know, it, it, it's, it's not really at the level, say, in South Africa, where you're concerned about, you know, is, are there sufficient police and are there sufficient uh, metal detectors at the doors? They, they are in a completely different scenario. Um, certainly some of the, the, the judges in the, in the Sahel region were saying that what they're doing is moving their families into the bigger cities where they are in, on, are in smaller outlying courts and then basically hunkering down, treating those courts as... Uh, a place where they eat, they sleep, and they they basically, um, you know, treat them as a as a fortress. Uh, other simple problems, um, which which my colleagues at at African Lee are working to to assist with, is things like access to case law, access to judgments. Um, in many countries, the reporting is behind. Um, the documents are not necessarily available. And there's, a, there's an entire free access to law movement across the continent, which is trying to make sure that the, the documents uh, that are absolutely integral to a judge doing their work are available online. We have other issues which I, I think are, are, are common um, to us to us all, and it's the, it's the question of, of executive interference and the, exec, the executive wanting to influence the way judiciaries make decisions. There are also weak systems for holding the judiciary to account. Um, we in South Africa are certainly very proud of our 
independent judiciary. Um, I think the, the minister, uh, former minister previously spoke about the, the real importance of the judiciary in holding the line on state capture. Um, there have been fiercely independent courts. Um, South Gauteng High Court merits a mention, the Constitutional Court. Um, they've, really, they've really done some excellent work. Um, but they, they have not been immune. Um, there have been challenges in terms of there's a, there's a particular judge who's been the subject of a complaint since 2008, and the matter is not yet resolved. Um, and there, there were serious allegations of, of approaching constitutional court judges and trying to influence them in relation to a, a, a legal matter involving the president. Um, we have uh, uh, just had a decision in which a commission of inquiry led by a judge um, has had its findings set aside because the, the commission didn't operate in the way that it should have. Uh, again, around the arms deal and, and uh, systematic uh, decisions taken to not consider relevant evidence. So even here, um, and, and the South African judiciary is, I have to say, one of the few proud things I, I have to, you know, one of my few proud things I am about South Africa right now. Um, but they, they really, um, I think, have demonstrated some of the principles that we, that we look at um, in terms of, of Bangalore. But um, I, would, I would suggest that um, in order to make sure that disputes can be resolved and credibly resolved, um, it's not enough to look at the narrowly at elections, at IECs, um, at parliaments, and, and, and issues um, which are obviously political parties are also central, as is the media. But uh, you have to look at when things go wrong, how you resolve them. And um, I think that, that I, would, I would certainly argue that a focus on a strong and independent judiciary um, is, a, is a critical part of, of a running a free and fair democratic process. Thanks, Simerson. We'll pick up some of the themes you mentioned around international standards, even professional associations. I thought that was quite interesting, that there are solidarity in these various spaces. Over to you, Herbal. Uh, thank you very much. I um, would like to thank the uh, Mandela School of Public Governance and uh, the um, Kofi Annan Foundation for inviting me to this important uh, discussion on democracy. And uh, as we reflect on the passing of the young girl, 19-year-old girl was raped, and as we reflect on uh, xenophobia, attacks, which I prefer to call Afrophobia. Um, I think at the heart of, of the Afrophobia uh, um, attacks taking place in South Africa at the moment is uh, the issue of elections uh, in countries where those people are being attacked are coming from. They find themselves here, as uh, Mama Gracia Machel say, because they are running away from misgovernance. And usually misgovernance is um, related to the stealing of elections. And in most cases, uh, information is key in dealing with uh, the issue of elections, uh, in helping us as citizens uh, understand why we should vote for a specific individual or not. And in most cases, um, in, in, in Africa in general and in Southern and Central Africa, we find that the average voter who lives in rural area, in a rural area, um, relies on radio. Um, rural area-based uh, voters rely on radio for information. And um, because the media is an irreversible feature of, uh, of our democracy and of uh, electoral politics, um, these radio stations are, in most cases, captured by interests which are either controlled by government or people who are related to, uh, to, to government. 
And as, as, as media, we are supposed to provide information analysis and uh, platforms for, for debates. And these debates assist um, voters in understanding whether something is real or something is not. Um, I think except for Southern Africa, um, except for South Africa, I think all the other countries in the SADC region, they don't have a vibrant media. Uh, the other country that was seen as an exception uh, was Botswana, but as my sister from Botswana was telling me in the morning, uh, it was because the ruling party um, it was never tested. And now that there are two bulls in the, in the crawl and, and, and the outgoing bull is still causing problems, their constitution is being tested. And you, you see that through how Botswana television reports on what's happening. It's uh, beholden to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to, to, to the government of Botswana. Uh, and as, as we heard today from Mama Gracia Machel that there's only one country in SADC uh, which, is, uh, which can be described as a full democracy. That country obviously is South Africa that she was referring to. But even in South Africa, there's, a, there's also a problem in terms of reportage because uh, certain, certain political parties accuse the ANC um, of controlling what comes out during election times. But I, what I find very interesting about that issue is that a couple of years ago, uh, I went to interview the current Minister of Education, uh, Bled Zibande, and he didn't know who I was. And uh, when we got there, our cameras, there was no paraphernalia on the cameras, so he didn't know which media organization. So he was told by someone that we knew that, oh, you know, there's South African media that wants to interview you. He was in Zimbabwe. And uh, he looked at us with a screw face, you know. And when, when we walked to get some drinks, uh, whilst the camera person was uh, uh, preparing the cameras, um, he was then told by, by, by this other gentleman that <clears throat> they're coming from uh, ETV. So when we came back, he suddenly stood up and he said, oh, hello, my brother. I thought you were coming from that bloody SABC. He was a minister <laughs> at, at, at that time. But there was a factional thing going on within the ANC. So even a political party can have its fights with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the media, especially those that are controlled by uh, government. I think the biggest problem that we have is that the media organizations in, in Southern Africa and Central Africa are not well-funded. So you find that in Zimbabwe, if uh, Professor Brian Raftopoulos or Brian Kagoro, if they write something, there's such a huge excitement uh, that, did you read what Brian Kagoro said? Did you see Professor uh, Brian Raftopoulos on, on, um, on, on TV, on Bloomberg? And these clips are going around. This is a reflection that the media is very weak. We have to rely on people who are outside these media institutions because they are not captured. Brian Kagore is not captured. Brian Raftopoulos is not captured. So they are able to write in a way that the media is failing to write so that the voter can understand what's going on and can understand the realities around them. So I'll give you a good example. You know, um, it's, it's, it's what is interesting about my country, Zimbabwe, is that um, Zimbabwe was the only country in Southern Africa that had a television station in 1960. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, there were only two countries that had television stations. It was Zimbabwe and Nigeria. And today, Zimbabwe is the only country of significance in, in sub-Saharan Africa that has only one television station. <laughs> and its, it's, uh, its sister state that shared uh, that exceptionalism of having a TV station in 1960 in Nigeria, today it has 113 TV stations. And if you look at how Zimbabwe has progressed 
with its elections and with its democracy, and you compare Nigeria, you can see the difference. And it tells us that uh, a strong media matters in elections because people are able to, to, to make decisions. And uh, the quality of reporting as well, it changes because there's competition. You want to be the best. Advertisers come where there's uh, good reporting, where there are good, good uh, news, news, um, news shows. But because ZBC is no competitor, uh, the quality of reporting is terrible. It, it's so bad that it's, it's even worse than a high school television station. Um, so how do we deal with these issues? So there was, a, there was a, a problem in the last election in 2018 where the state media was refusing to give access to other political parties, which are not ZANU-PF, to its platforms to propagate their views, to propagate what they will do for a voter, the difference between them and ZANU-PF, etc., etc. So the gentleman sitting over there, Douglas, uh, uh, Doug Colted, uh, took the state media to court. And he said... This is unconstitutional because our constitution has prescriptions which require you to behave in a certain way. And as usual, as you would know with our, with our judiciaries in, 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 uh, in Africa, they sit on the case until after the elections. Then they pronounced that, oh, no, Doug Holter, you're actually right. They were supposed to do that. And the, the permanent secretary of information uh, went to Twitter and he said, we respect the rule of law and uh, uh, we, we have no problem with this judgment. It explains everything that we need to do. That was before they had reflected on what the judgment actually means to their electoral fortunes as ZANU-PF because it required them to give the opposition not only during the election time but throughout the process um, because the mistake we make is we look at an election as, a, as an event. It's a process which starts with the day a new president is inaugurated until the next ele election. Then all of a sudden, um, we heard that the state media was now challenging Doug um, uh, the, the ruling he got from the court. So essentially, the state media is saying to the court, to the Court of Appeal, we don't want to do what the Constitution requires us to do. Uh, which means that between now and the next election, the rural voter who relies on Zimbabwe radio will not be able to hear other voices. Um, and this, this is part of uh, uh, what, what people like Brian Kagore have explained for years that, you know, what we did is we captured colonial institutions, but instead of reforming them, we appropriated them and we said we want to have this power that the white colonials had. We want to own it and we want to use it against our own people. So this becomes so easy because of uh, uh, poverty. Journalists in the region, in Africa, are poor uh, compared to their counterparts in Europe and in America. So uh, I'll give you a good example. In 2013, after the elections, I invited the new information minister, uh, Jonathan Moyo, to my house and, and the head of the World Bank in Zimbabwe at that time. So I said, gentlemen, come, let's have lunch. We want to talk about the media and how the World Bank can assist in reforming these institutions. So to, 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 to explain the poverty uh, narrative, uh, the minister came to my house. He had never been to my house. So I decided that we would have, it was the Saturday afternoon, we would have the lunch uh, sitting at the bar. Um, and he looked at the bottles of whisk that were on my bar. And uh, there were quite many because, you know, over the years as I have been traveling, I buy one or two and I just put them there. So he said, is that real whisk or is tea? <laughs> and and the, the, the World Bank uh, gentleman said, what do you mean? And he says, how can a journalist afford all that stuff? So, so that mentality that they have, the political elites, it explains how they are able to manipulate us because 
in Zimbabwe, it's not only the state media, even the private media, the, the, the political elites, they use brown envelope journalism. They pay them. And uh, that affects electoral outcomes because what they report is then controlled by the players themselves who are participating in those, uh, in those uh, elections. And um, the, I think the, the, the key issue um, when I look at it, it's not just about our democracy, but it's about individuals. So I'll go back to Zambia. You know, uh, I call Kaunda the father of democracy in Southern Africa because he was the first president to lose an election and he went without a fight. And at that time, the, the media was not strong in, uh, in, uh, in Zambia. But because individuals can make change, they can assist in how these institutions can be shaped. Uh, there was no drama in, in, in Zambia as you have uh, in Zimbabwe. So in, in conclusion, I just want to touch a few things that have been said. The Zimbabwean election, the doc said that in 2008, they were, you couldn't even call them an election. And in 2013, there was a change. I, I differ with you, Doc. What happened in 2008 was that there was so much violence, uh, and then the ruling party was forced to sit in a government of national unity with the opposition, and Mugabe didn't like that experience. So he went back and told his enforcers that we have to find another solution. We don't want another GNU. So the election was not blood in 2013 because they invested in technology, the technologies that were being talked about in the morning from, from Asia. The opposition was beaten, but more importantly, the, the, the ruling party MPs, they didn't even know how they won. And they were so open about it that, you know, we were supposed to lose, how did we win? So <laughs> Mugabe invested in technology that was sophisticated. And um, then there's the issue of um, the conversations that was talked about in, with, in, with political parties in, um, in Ghana. Our opposition will tell you that, no, the, to go to Ghana and have these conversations, it's pointless because the issue is not about how to win an election, but how to make sure that when you have won, the result is, is respected. So the opposition is winning elections but it's not allowed to take over when they win these elections. And um, we, we, have a, we have a big problem that we need to address that was mentioned about uh, people understanding the role of the MP when they've won the election. The problem also should be put on us, the media, because we are supposed to tell the readers and the listeners, what their MP is supposed to be doing. But we are not doing that. In fact, in Zimbabwe, it, it really bothers me. MPs are doing the work for councillors because the work for councillors gets you votes. Instead of going to parliament to make laws, MPs will come and deal with issues. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, a pipe that is burst. That is the work of the councillor. And until the media is able to explain those things, uh, our elections will remain, will remain warped. Thank you, Hopewell. Um, Hopewell, I allowed you to go a bit earlier on because I saw you were starting to engage with your fellow panelists, and that was going to be exciting as we start interacting. Um, I think you do raise an interesting issue about what level of elections we're looking at. Just your last example of, of the councillor and possibly more opportunities for rent-seeking or more access to, to funding versus parliamentary elections. And so when we're thinking about a panel on elections, you know, it's a very broad topic. So just to note that. Um, in preparing for this panel, I did look at what the Africa Integrity Indicators have um, described as key international standards around transparency and accountability when it comes to elections. And I'll just refer to them briefly because I think especially the Africa Integrity Indicators, which cover all 55 countries over the last seven years, which is a partnership with the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, um, which go into the Ibrahim Index. Um, there's a question in law, 
the independence of the agencies or agencies mandated to organize and monitor national elections is guaranteed. And if you look at the Africa Integrity website, green is positive. So in law, in many African countries, there is a law which guarantees the independence of an electoral agency because obviously that's linked to legitimacy and, and the independence of the institution. There are two questions then which deal with in practice. In practice, the appointments to the agency mandated to organize and monitor national elections support the independence of the agency. That's one thing. And in practice, the agency mandated to organize and monitor national elections is protected from political interference. And it's very clear that the map turns red if you look at that for the data for 2018. One other important aspect is around access to information in terms of the availability of reports which are issued by the agency mandated to organize and monitor national elections. And that's really the free flow of information because you can have an election, but when do we get the results? Can we trust the results? And I think the timeliness, the management, um, the capacity of independent electoral monitoring agencies is also key in terms of legitimacy to get the mandate to then conduct the reforms which are needed, which is why you need elections, right? Um, to create a mandate for a ruling party to govern. And then finally, the question which the Africa Integrity Indicators ask in relation to elections is, in practice, do candidates and political parties have equitable access to state-owned media outlets? So I found that point very interesting um, in terms of you know, the timeliness around, is it just around elections that there's equal access to media, if at all, which in the case of the Africa Integrity Indicators, the map reveals that in practice, there isn't equitable access. So, you know, those are international standards and norms. We talked earlier this morning about whether there could be potentially um, an African way of running elections and, and an African democracy. And I, I think we have to recognize we're in a global context and we have our own experiences to draw on and we can learn, for example, from the Ghanaian experience of running elections. I think the South African experience is, is also um, positive. So if I might open the floor now, we've got... 25 minutes until we end the day, and I see one question there, another question there, another question there, and another question there. So let's take the first round, if we may. Please just introduce yourself briefly, just your name and where you're from. Okay, I'm Samson Itodo from Nigeria. Um, two points. One, the cost of elections. Um, increasingly, we're spending more resources um, on elections. And my question to the panel do you think we're getting investment or return on our investment um, with respect to the cost of, of elections um, that is rising? I think recently it was Kenya that had the highest, a little um, around um, either 25 or $18 per voter. Um, so that's, that's, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on that. The second is, uh, when you talk about political parties, and I love the point you made about independent candidates, and my question will be, what do you think is the future of political parties in, in Africa? I say this in, in view of the fact that if you look across Africa, it does appear voters vote for individuals and not the political party or the party manifesto. And as of today, and correct me if I'm wrong, the only function that a political party conducts that is different from what a social movement or a civil society does is present candidates. Because the, the task of political socialization has been abdicated to civil society. Um, if you talk about aggregation of even public interest, to a large extent, civil society and social movements are performing that role. And so, do you think we will get to a point where we would not have political parties um, anymore and we're going to evolve with a different um, platform for fielding candidates um, for our elections? Thank you. If we could keep it to one question, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Kibwit Simachangan. I'm from International Idea, but 
in terms of country I'm from Botswana. Um, the issue of dominant party systems, uh, because I really think that in, in Southern Africa especially, uh, that is really the, the issue that we need to be also reflecting on. We, we have had, I believe, uh, two, two ways in which this can go, and I think Zimbabwe has shown us one way in which uh, once uh, there's a credible opposition party that rises against the dominant party, how things can go. Uh, Zambia at some point gave us a, quite a very positive uh, example of another way in which it can go when a dominant party loses uh, elections. But I, I'm just wondering for the many countries that are still really ruled by parties that liberation struggle parties or parties that were, were you know, led, led these countries to independence, Botswana being one of them that for 53 years now in, in September, it, uh, we have been uh, ruled by the uh, Botswana Democratic Party. I wonder now that there is, there appears to be this good possibility that um, an opposition party might either take over or there might be very a small margin, um, uh, a very uh, highly contested election. How will it go? I mean, th for me, this is the question that keeps on nagging me to say, will, will we go the Zimbabwe way or will we go the Zambia, uh, the Zambia way? And I think this morning when we had the conversation with my brother there, for me, it's really the issue of also institutions. How can we build institutions that also rein in individuals? Because in Botswana, I believe that one of the, the reasons we are going the way we are going is that I think for many years we didn't realize that some of our institutions were quite weak. Uh, some of the previous presidents, they came in uh, probably out of their own personalities. They didn't uh, really overreach, you know, uh, some of the... We, we even discovered that some of our, our constitution actually gave the president so much powers. We, it's like we discovered it for the first time because the other previous presidents never really bothered to use all of the powers that the constitution bestowed upon them. And then once we had a president who wanted to use each and every, you know, uh, bit of power that was, then that we realized, oh, actually, we are not as good as we think we, we have been. So I, I'm just saying, you know, we need to also have institutions that rein in, you know, this executive overreach so that we don't depend on the benevolence of somebody's character, but rather that institutions are able to rein in people. So there were, I don't want to miss out on the people I said who could. One, one, and okay. Great. Uh, I want to speak in French. Merci. Euh, merci beaucoup pour euh, les différentes interventions. Je voulais poser une question par rapport, à, par rapport au rôle des institutions dans euh, la sauvegarde de la démocratie. Et une des institutions qui joue souvent un rôle important dans le, dans le processus démocratique et souvent les élections, c'est l'armée. Et en Afrique particulièrement, euh, l'armée est souvent un outil dont se servent euh, les pouvoirs, soit pour euh, se maintenir et proclamer un résultat qui n'est pas conforme euh, aux résultats euh, qui ont été euh, transparents lors des élections, mais aussi, parfois, euh, l'armée sert à imposer un jeu démocratique qui sauvegarde une démocratie militarisée. Et la plupart de fois, dans nos pays, même quand les citoyens veulent s'investir pour euh, réclamer à ce que la transparence électorale soit respectée. Souvent, l'armée pose problème. Et donc, ma question, c'était de savoir comment, sur le plan régional, sur le plan africain, il est possible de, de, de pouvoir surmonter la barrière que représente parfois l'armée pour les transitions démocratiques pacifiques dans nos pays. Parce que la plupart de fois, ce qui contraint les autres organisations à ne pas 
imposer le point de vue de la transparence ou la vérité des élections, c'est qu'ils disent privilégier la stabilité des pays. Donc, en quelque sorte, dire si nous intervenons, si nous voulons imposer une certaine transparence des élections, il peut y avoir euh, des instabilités et donc parfois même l'implication de l'armée pour devoir euh, imposer une certaine, euh, un certain résultat euh, des élections. Y a-t-il un mécanisme régional africain qui permette au fait de pouvoir répondre à, à, ce grand, à cette grande barrière institutionnelle à l'alternance démocratique Merci. I just have a question on the impact of money in politics and campaign financing and how that also, you know, how do we, I think different countries, oh, sorry, I'm Daddy Sai from Accountability Lab. I'm a Zimbabwean living in South Africa. So my question is around money in politics and campaign financing and the impact that um, it has in sort of subverting the will of the people or influencing the political um, the electoral outcomes, and you know, what are some of the best practices in terms of regulation? Um, I think that there have been different uh, approaches to this, and I just want to hear what the panel has to say. Thank you. One last one on this side. I'll get to that side after. Okay, so my name is uh, Unopa Makanyanga, and I'm from Zimbabwe. My question is um, understanding that in a couple of years, the majority of the electorate is going to be Gen Z and millennials. So what is the impact of generational trends um, on elections? And how do we respond to these trends, understanding that Gen Z and millennials are very different from baby boomers and Gen X? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to turn to the panel now. If there are any questions which any of you want to respond to, from Gen Z to the army, to the cost of elections, to dominant party systems, um, to money and politics. Who has something to say? Okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> Let me rather give Matthias, and then we can come back. Okay. Sure. So um, do we get return on our investments? Um, or could social movements do the trick? I think... They can't do the trick. Um, part of the reason is because otherwise they wouldn't have a job anymore. <laughs> um, but I think social movements, they're usually characterized by having much flatter hierarchies, and they often have a particular thing that they rally around. And then they can be really, really effective. Um, but they're not institutionalized. They, they're not as good as creating institutional memory or then shifting their attention to something else. Um, so I think that is one, um, one drawback that social movements have. Um, but it's true that in many cases we focus on the individuals rather than the parties. Um, and then obviously money comes, comes in as well. And especially independents seem to pop up, especially if we have bad primary elections. So if someone, if a candidate is discontent with the results of a primary election, they think, no, I know my constituency, I know I can win, so let me stand as an independent. Um, so one thing to combat that and actually to have a more coherent competition um, is to improve the quality of primary elections. Now, as citizens, we can try and do that. Um, we could develop social movements around that, and here Malawi has made some really interesting progress um, to say, and so this is another, another technical thing, but often, uh, within a constituency, it's not so much competition between two parties, but within a single party. Once a party won the primary, um, they're more likely to win that constituency. So what we often miss as election observers is we go there at ele on election day thinking we're now observing more or less well how the election is going. We, we missed the party. We're too late. What really matters is the, the quality of the primary election. And so I would, I would encourage us to, to focus more on those. Um, and maybe a, a, a sweep to the, to the, to the dominant party systems. Um, I think it's, it's really important um, to look at the, the issue of factionalism. 
which comes exactly um, also down to the issue of how competitive are constituencies. If I know a particular party is, is dominant in that constituency, it's easier for me to go into that party and then work my way up or, or, or try and capture that rather than starting a whole new party. And so even if we have a dominant party system, we can still hold people accountable, even as ordinary citizens, by asking them, by asking the candidates, what are you doing? Um, and we can do that even if we have limited choice on election day, but <laughs> parties often still run primaries, so we can still ask um, them. And yeah, I think I'll leave that for the other panels and panelists for, for now. I think on the issue of political parties, it depends. Uh, with, with, it's, it's a country-to-country -country issue. Because if you are talking about Zimbabwe, the political party has been used since independence as a vehicle to capture the state. And once you capture the state, you, you, you use the political party during the five-year period as a vehicle for patronage. So ZANU-PF... Whenever there's, a starv whenever there's starvation, like right now, five million of our people are facing starvation, uh, international donor organizations will bring food to the country. And that food is, is distributed by the government as it were, but it's actually the party. They use the party structures. So until we resolve the issues of poverty in Zimbabwe, People will tell you in rural areas that if we don't vote for ZANU-PF, we will die with hunger. So we go to ZANU-PF because we get food from them. So that's the uniqueness of the, of the Zimbabwean situation. And then the issue, I will, I will try, and, and someone else can, can, can add on to this, the issue of the military. In Zimbabwe, the issue of the military is, is very unique. It's different from Botswana. Uh, and it's different from, from, uh, from, from other countries because the military generals who are in power today in Zimbabwe were the military generals during, during the, the, the armed struggle. So what you have, it's a, it's a political party that is in power because of the military. The, the relationship is not just uh, of generals and, and, and the political party, but the, the military is the political party. That's why when General Chiwenga removed Mugabe through a coup, he became a vice president. And on the eve of the coup, he said, we are going to deal with the situation in our party. And his party was ZANU-PF. So until this liberation generation goes, uh, we will have problems with the military because the military says ZANU-PF is our party. So the political elites uh, are actually... Um, beholden to the military. So, picking up on liberation generation versus generation Z, does anyone on the panel who has voting age children, are they voting? <laughs> do they want to vote? How do they make elections sexy? I mean, how do we get people, young people, to vote? I think that the... The question was on the impact of millennials on elections. Um, I think that's very exciting. Uh, it undermines the, the, the narrative by the liberation aristocracy. Uh, for example, the ANC, ZANU-PF, SWAPO in Namibia, uh, who appeal to voters on the basis of their liberation credentials. The, the young voters who are coming up today don't have any attachment to those uh, historical um, you know, uh, developments. So they are not. I'm not saying they are not important. I'm saying that increasingly, then parties will have to identify the policy appeals that make sense to this demography of people. In South Africa, for example, the rise of the EFF is increasingly because it is able to capture this youth constituency that is unpersuaded by the narrative that they see the part of uh, the end of apartheid. There are certain appeals and aspirations which people want that cannot be met by a promise of um, you know, patriotism or the part of liberation. Um, I, I see it, uh, the same situation in, in Zimbabwe, for example. Uh, once this uh, liberation uh, aristocracy is gone, um, you know, 
that that will take forward. But it's already happening in urban areas, for example. The opposition is much more entrenched in urban centers because the the, the narrative of uh, the part of liberation is is unconvincing. So I think it's a good thing, and we should have more and more young voters, perhaps, uh, for going for the future. I also wanted to speak to this issue of um, the role of um, campaign finance. Uh, is it to be should we regulate it, for example, because elections increasingly are becoming expensive, and what it, that, that is doing is that it, it enables um, external interest groups, for example, to sponsor uh, a number of political elites, uh, both in opposition and, 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 the, um, and, in, and those in power. Um, I think it would be important to have some kind of public funding for parties because then you are leveling the playing field. Because if you have two parties that are heavily financed uh, by external interests, for example, and you have a cluster of other parties that are poorly funded, that really affects the quality of democracy and even electoral outcomes. So it would be important, for, for example, to have some kind of regulation that allows funding of political parties, particularly those that are represented, say, uh, in the National Assembly. But that, of course, increases the cost of uh, running elections. And someone was saying, was asking earlier to say, um, are we getting returns for the investment in elections? Well, well, democracy is extremely expensive, and every quality thing has a cost to it. Rather than focusing on the cost of the elections or democracy, we should focus more on who is financing it. Because if the financier for democratic institutions is external, then that democracy is saving that external financier. We should get to a point where we ourselves, in our own countries, uh, begin to finance institutions of democracy, be it civil society, for example, so that ZANPF won't say, uh, you shut up because you're financed by Western countries. The people themselves should be able to say, we want democracy, but therefore we have to recognize that there's a cost that comes to it and we have to pay for it. Thank you. Alison, did you want to add anything? Matthias? to this is it's true that we spend a lot of money on, on elections uh, and that sometimes candidates spend really, really huge amounts on that. But if we flip it, maybe we should ask, what's the cost of not doing that? So spending lots of money every couple of years, that's not cheap. But not having certain freedoms, not having the the freedom to choose a party at, at any point, I think costs us even more in the long run. And what would be really helpful in, in this context is to look at, I think one question was around the best practice of, of campaign funding, is in Southern Africa, the, the election laws, despite the, the most recent uh, party funding law, are quite lax. Until now, we don't know where the ANC really gets its money from, nor do we know the ANC. Uh, sorry, the, the, the DA. So even if there was a transition in power, we don't know really who funds the DA. In other parts of Africa, um, we've got much more transparent, um, much more transparent laws, and I think the idea has collected some, some really good data on that comparatively. Of course, the question is, are these implemented or not? But I think that's a secondary question, and it then takes a separate group to litigate uh, around these laws. But f the, first, the first thing is really to put these laws in place. And here, again, we don't need to learn from, uh, from, from Western countries. We can look on our own continent and look how other uh, countries are doing it, and often doing it much better. Let me just add, on the military uh, question, um, there are two brief points to make there. The first is that you see increased military involvement in politics in countries that have uh, a history where the liberation movement had an army, more like the Mukoto SCs, where the NPA, for example, had that army section. Namibia had, uh, had a defense uh, section. There, there was an interview that Mbeki, uh, President Tavo Mbeki made recently where he, he made a, a startling liberation that, suggest, that said the army here was actually willing to intervene if he told them that he didn't want to go after 2008. Um, and he said, I don't know whether he was giving himself credit here. He said, no, 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 I said, step back, let democracy win. And the ANC have recorded me and therefore I have to go. Uh, you could link that willingness on the part of the military elites, for example, to intervene to that history. We are seeing that in Zimbabwe. It's possible it could happen in Namibia where there's that distance, lack of distance between the political elites 
and the military elites and, the, and, and those, those linkages. But the military is a very opportunistic machine. They intervene only where they want their candidate in power. They intervened in, in Zimbabwe primarily because they felt if Grace Mugabe, for example, was the successor, he didn't have the, the kind of networks that they wanted the successor to be, and that's how Mnagagwa was brought in. You see that also in, in, in Sudan and in Algeria. After the transition has happened, it's back to square one. And we do not, I don't think we should place much faith in that institution. So we have four minutes left for this panel. Um, I'm looking to the side. Are there very burning questions? I can see one hand has remained up. Brian? Uh, just a small clarification. The military in Zimbabwe didn't intervene because of grace. The military interest in Zimbabwe is based on two factors, the wealth in Congo and the wealth in Zimbabwe. So if we want to understand the military's interest in politics, uh, let's step away from elections, because that's not their primary concern. Let's actually trace the money, and then we'll understand. Yeah, you are sitting next to a gentleman there who could actually give you a little bit. I hear these anecdotes in the media about Grace and the military. Grace was not a factor at all. One last question there. Good afternoon. My name is Mosoto Muepia. I am from South Africa. <clears throat> the, there was an issue raised about um, lack of uh, non-independent electoral management bodies. And, um, you know, SADC, uh, the region, um, has a number of elections this year. Um, we have, we've had uh, Malawi, South Africa, Botswana is coming up, Mozambique, Namibia, and, you know, one of the countries that was mentioned in a, in a panel discussion is experiencing a problem of ongoing protests ever since election results were declared. Interestingly, in that country, when the Electoral Commission declared the election results, organized civil society had um, parallel vote tabulation, which, which matched the electoral management body's election results one for one. And protests have arisen ever since. It is my understanding that the, the panel, one of the panelists was saying, you know, this is an issue of people don't like these results, there must be something wrong. I fundamentally say we do have an issue, and let's not make it an elephant in the room. The issue is there are challenges democracies face, amongst others, those of powerful elites refusing to accept the outcome of an election. What are we to do about that? So with one minute left, I'm going to ask this gentleman to ask his last question. Maybe he can respond to yours. Okay, my name is Mundia. Uh, I'm from the Graduate School of Business. And the simple question that I have is, uh, why do we seem to be excluding the private sector in all these conversations? They, when they can actually resolve some of the challenges that we basically have highlighted in the judiciary in terms of recruitment processes, uh, let alone how to run more effective electoral commissions, and ultimately in terms of dissemination of uh, electoral outcomes. You know, is, 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 is that a deliberate attempt, or is it something that builds on Brian's earlier statement today where he says somebody is always bound to be excluded and it just happens to be the private sector? Thank you for that question. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I'm sure this is an open forum, so private sector was willing and able to be here. But in terms of the structure of the program and explicitly thinking creatively how the business community, other than capturing and funding elections, could actually play a positive role, I think that's quite a useful contribution. So with my authority as the moderator of this panel, I'm going to thank my fellow panelists for their contributions. And also just to say that we can continue the conversation tomorrow 
we have an opportunity to pick up on the very rich threads um, and continue the conversation on democracy and go back to the wailing wall. Um, and thank you to, to Kamai. And just... Elections are supposed to be empowering. They're supposed to be a tool for participation and inclusion. And election time is supposed to be more joyful and uh, a moment for hope. But sadly, in many places, elections are an act of war, especially in Africa. It is a time for blood and tears. And there is an architecture that is supposed to be in place to promote that participation. And when that architecture, like the courts, approve an election in which 200 people have been killed, they're basically saying, it's okay to kill and win an election. So these institutions then become accomplices in structural, direct, and cultural violence. And this is a conversation which I think the panel tried to unpack, but uh, I think as Marianne said, the conversation has to continue. And tomorrow we get into participation and inclusion. Please help me thank Marianne and the airboard panel for a wonderful <laughs> job. So we have come to the end of day one of our discussion. And as we have reflected, uh, the blocks that we are looking at today, uh, mainly the institutions, the architecture of democracy, how it's supposed to work and how it is failing to work. Tomorrow we open another page on uh, participation, on inclusion, which will include issues to do with youth participation, issues to do with the digital age, tools and elections. So I encourage you to be here again at 8.30 at the Wailing Wall and see how we can uh, keep pushing the Wailing Wall. I have a few announcements to make. By now, most of you should have received an online survey from the Kofi Annan Foundation. Just like elections, we encourage you to participate faithfully in that survey. And we will be back at 8.30 to, to reflect. May we continue the conversation over dinner until tomorrow. Please thank you and have a wonderful evening.